a lot of big cases. Yeah, I think I'll start off today. Um, let's see, I gotta share my screen. All righty. So, um, oh, here comes some people on. Um, I might save the fungus cases for David. He likes those. Um, this is an interesting post-op case. Uh, we don't. We do a fair amount of VADs, but I haven't. We don't see too many complications, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, if they, if we just don't image them or or what. But um, this is a uh, younger patient in her 40s who has cardiomyopathy related to treatment for Hodgkin lymphoma, and is currently uh, had a VAD place while waiting for transplant. And this was a post-op. Uh, non-con CT. I can't remember why we did it. This was some time ago, almost a year ago. But it just shows the usual placement. And one of the things they always do is they put this, uh, and uh, Travis, you may know more about this. They put this patch here, usually over the ventricle, sort of a, I guess a Dacron patch or Gore-Tex patch, I think to prevent adhesions and, and stuff like that. And uh, she came to us recently with uh, leukocytosis and Ultimately, it was diagnosed uh, with, uh, with st staph MSSA in her uh, bloodstream, but they were looking for a source in the chest, and this is what we came across. As you can see, that patch has been displaced away from the visceral pericardium. There's gas in the effusion. And there's also a little bit of gas up near the, um, the aortic limb here, so uh, presumably this is infected. And unfortunately, they can't really take the VAD out. Uh, their only option is transplant. So they're trying to treat her medically, get, you know, just kind of keep, keep the infection contained until she can get a, a transplant. But, you know, we see effusions, but this displacement of this patch, I thought was kind of an interesting finding and really had me worried. And then the gas sort of just sealed the deal there. Yeah, that's a weird location of, of all that fluid. Yeah. Just displacing that away from the epicardial fat. But yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, sounds like it's infected. Yeah, that's the presumption. Yeah, because there it was. You can see that it usually sits right there. So, um, you know, and there was always this component anteriorly. Some It's probably a lot of pericardial thickening. So that, um, but it is in communication because there is some gas over here. So that was a interesting, uh, something I just don't, I just don't see a lot of complications of VADs. So uh, let's see what we got here. Okay. Is David on yet? Nope. All right. Well, um, this is a case Julie sent me just uh, the other day, and I like this one. Um, so this is a radiograph of a patient um, who has tuberculosis, um, but it's kind of an interesting pattern in that it looks a lot like sarcoid. And I'll show you the uh, CT. But you can see the upper lobe lung disease is kind of a fine nodular pattern. There's some distortion, uh, no effusion or anything else. And I've got a couple of CTs. Uh, let's see. Let's. This is the first CT. This was the at about four years ago uh, from the the radiograph, and you can see this almost looks very much like sarcoid galaxy signs or even fairy ring signs, where it looks like a an atoll sign, but it's consisting of micronodules rather than um, just smooth consolidation and ground glass. Plus, there's a little cavity up in here, but it has very discrete margins. So to me. Um, you know, I see this, and if I didn't know better and didn't have the cavities, I might even be thinking about sarcoid. Now, there are some airway-centric nodules, which would be unusual for sarcoid, so that should also, but these look like little sarcoid galaxies or fairy ring signs. So that was 2014, and then I'll just jump ahead um, to 2018. The patient received treatment, and you can see it it, it improved quite a bit. Um, those The degree of nodules has gone away, but there's still a lot of upper lobe volume loss. You can see some bronchiectasis. Um, and still some stuff there. So this was a pretty bad case of uh, tuberculosis. I don't know any risk factors about the patient, but I thought good examples of the fairy ring sign, which isn't talked about much anymore, but uh, I think it's a great finding, uh, especially for granulomatous organizing pneumonia. Okay, let's see here. Um, let me show this case. So this is an interesting phenomenon that we have seen quite a bit of, and one of my former fellows did a RSNA poster on this topic, and that is calcifying lymph nodes. And this is a patient, she's uh, in her 60s, with uh, cis-adenocarcinoma of the ovary, and it was a low-grade tumor. And I learned from one of my abdominal colleagues that uh, these low-grade tumors tend to exhibit this behavior of sort of slow growth. They don't respond well to treatment. Uh, but they develop calcifications in their metastases as part of the just the tumor growth. So this is uh, an older scan a few years ago, and you can see in these cardiophrenic nodes, although they're not big, 
they've got some calcium in it, which should all in these patients with these low grade or borderline ovarian carcinomas should be viewed with uh, suspicion for metastases. Here we are four years later, as I said, these don't tend to respond well to treatment, but progress slowly. And in this example here, we can see those nodes are bigger and densely calcified. But what I thought was really cool were these, these, these new calcifications in the extra pleural tissue. So in the little tiny lymph nodes that we typically don't even see or see at all or see well, we're starting to see these metastases. And you can see them all along the posterior pleural space. Here's one in the extra pleural fat. You can see it's starting to calcify just faintly, these little nodules, and there's a whole bunch of them. But, and then we had some bigger nodes in the mediastinum that weren't calcifying the axilla, which clearly looked like tumor, but recognizing that these calcifications, and even here, sort of suboccipital, lower neck, you see these calcified lymph nodes that we just don't usually even think about. So yeah. teaching point is if you see progressive calcification in lymph nodes, it's not always histo, TB, or, you know, or pneumoconiosis, but in these borderline tumors. And you can actually see it along, the, I think, along the peritoneum as well here, sort of a carcinomatosis type little studying, but just slowly growing over four or five years in this case. All righty. Uh, yeah, actually, Jeff, just really quickly, because we've shown cases of osteosarcoma and chondrosarcoma as well that ossify the mets or calcify. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had a case of a giant cell tumor of bone that had calcified nodules, which I had not seen before, but wow. it's going to be the unusual calcification, yeah, not they, always benign. And they so rarely metastasize the giant cells. Okay, um, I'll show this last case, and if there's time, I'll do some more. But this is, um, you know, it's that time of year again where we start seeing uh, some of our endemic fungi. So this is a uh, younger guy who came in with a cough, shortness of breath, also some vague pelvic pain and this is his radiograph at the time of presentation you can see he's just got diffuse tiny nodules uh, there's the lateral it's backwards on the outside but maybe some tiny effusions but not much to speak of and really no substantial lymph node enlargement so um, he wasn't he was sick um, so you still have to think about miliary TB but in our neck of the woods we're much more likely going to see blasto this time of year um, because of its latency and uh, often these patients will get infected in the late fall, either hunting or sort of before the winter uh, camping or any sort of outdoors. And he did spend a lot of time near water. I can't remember exactly what he did. I made some notes of it, but uh, he did have some reasonable exposures for blastomycosis. Um, and then he also, I'll show the CT scan, which just show this is an outside CT, so not the best sharpest image but you can see if i find a nice image without some motion that these are actually micro nodules uh, in the lungs and then in his abdominal ct i did mention he had that pelvic pain uh, they found this in the prostate sort of this enlarged prostate with this area of necrosis so this is an abscess here and uh, it's not one of the places i think about with blasto i think of bone skin occasionally the brain of course lungs being number one but it can cause a prostatitis as well so he's currently being treated on itraconazole, uh, and they usually treat them for, I think it's up to a year, so it takes a long time, but uh, generally they'll make a full recovery if, if they don't, uh, he didn't develop ARDS or any other complications, so that's a blastomycosis case. Wow. Yeah, I have another one, but I'll show it later if there's time. It just, we've had two, I've had two blasto cases, actually the third one just came in yesterday, so I've had three cases in this week. So I didn't, I didn't, I used to see it more in the spring and the summer when people were outside, but I learned years ago from one of our infectious disease docs, who's an expert in the, in Blasto, that it's not uncommon to see it three or four months later. So we saw, we've seen several cases in January, February, uh, because of the latency. All right. Who would like to go next? I can show some. All right. I see that Seth is on here now. This is an interesting case that came in. I think we've had discussions on, on management of this before, but this is a patient who you can see is intubated, had a relatively acute onset of, of heart failure after a recent myocardial infarction. You can see they have a pulmonary artery catheter at this point. But when you, on this PE study, there's a large acquired ventricular septal defect. And you can see there's a little bit of decreased en enhancement in this area. 
So this was, of course, a, an acquired ventricular septal defect from prior MI. And for whatever reason, we see a lot of these, you know, the, I don't know, four or five that I've seen have a lot of, often are at the inferior wall, as in this case. And there's not really much in terms of inferior myocardium left, but there's no pericardial effusion at this point. So the discussion is like, do they treat this percutaneously with a an, some sort of amplatzer closure device? And I think Seth, we've had this discussion before, right? Did we show a case where I can't remember, but yeah. you know, there's not a lot of normal myocardium here. It's not like this is just a, an AST where you or a, a you know muscular VST where you've got normal stuff to anchor this into, and you'll see where this is going. But I do include the. Uh, the, the cath, because I think it's pretty interesting to see the left ventricular gram. You just see this instant shunting into the right ventricle through this big inferior wall or, or you know, inferior septum VSD. Well, they closed it or at least put this in. You can see, it, see that it's reduced a little, but there's still some blood that's shunting across there into the right ventricle. But anyway, that was on the first. And then the next morning, she developed sudden onset of chest pain. This was when I was working on Saturday. And you can see now that she has a large volume of hemopericardium. This thing is still situated in the, in the interventricular septum. But you know, unfortunately, this is you know, no doubt ruptured into the pericardial space at this point. She has an intraaortic balloon pump, which you can see incidentally is a little low too. It's at the left main bronchus. And as a result, you know, the radiopaque marker is going to be well below the level of the renal and the SMA as you see down here, but there's, she's actually stable in the IC right now and she has other comorbidities and hasn't made it to the OR yet, but this is you know, eventual just completion rupture. You know, probably, I don't know if it's related directly to the procedure or if it, you know, the inferior wall was just necrotic enough that it eventually ruptured as well, but you know, this is all from her infarct. So as septal, a cause of- She had yeah. a septal rupture and then she had a inferior wall rupture as well? Yeah. yeah. Because I've seen a couple of cases with combined inferior, or like septal and inferior wall rupture, where the, yeah, the infarct. Yeah, I don't think I've seen one where you get yeah, both. I don't know, but like I, I just imagine they're putting this thing into like wall that's like cottage cheese, because it's not like it's just a bit well-defined hole there. The whole myocardium is dead. Yeah. So, anyway, I was a couple of my colleagues tried to talk the interventionalists out of this approach, but you know there were. Trying, trying this as a temporizing measure, at least, just because she's not really an operative candidate. So, oh, she developed the inferior wall after the. Oh, well, after the, I mean, well, the, the the inferior wall ruptured the day after they placed that, uh, or you know, right after they placed this, because this was even four days after that original CT, and she has a small volume of, of fluid, but it wasn't as, you know, it wasn't as dense. And then they placed this the closure device, and then the next morning she now has a large volume of hemopericardium. Yeah. Now this is this is a pretty interesting case, and this was a brought to my attention by our neuro colleagues. So this is a patient who, you know, middle of January doesn't look that bad. He's got a pick because he's on chemo for new diagnosis of AML, and it, it, my understanding was it was refractory. I'm not exactly sure you know the status of it, but anyway, he was neutropenic, and then at the end of January now has some consolidation in the left lower lobe, small effusion. They never did a chest CT, but he had some stroke symptoms at the same time. So they did a stroke CT. And I'll just start at the top and you'll see that there are a bunch of small little, you know, right here, these areas of edema, bilateral look like areas of just what they thought were probably embolic infarcts, both in supra and infratentorial, no macroscopic vessel occlusion but my neuro colleague called me because of the stuff that was going on in the lungs. And you'll see as we scroll down here that I have never you know, seen this degree of involvement from what, what this eventually turned out to be. But if you just see the pulmonary artery, you think the pulmonary artery, it's maybe a pulmonary embolism here as that left lower lobe pulmonary artery just abruptly cuts off. But the thing is too, that the, the pulmonary veins are gone on this side as are the airways. And then you can see this looks like just a big hemorrhagic infarction in the right or in the left lower lobe. Some little nodules there probably from the airway involvement. And so with all of this and the fact that there was that stuff in the, in the brain, 
we thought this, and he was still neutropenic. We thought this was probably going to be an angioinvasive mucor. Um, just given that it was involving both the arteries and the vein, although that's a little unusual. And I was able to pull up a CT from a couple months ago, and you'll see that at the end of December, there's nothing in those areas. And that radiograph I showed originally was in the interim, you know, where this, whatever, this a little bit of edema and, and whatnot had it had cleared. But um, have, has anybody ever seen Mucor do this with both arterial and venous invasion? No. So I just got the path back yesterday and it was like this. It's, it's a still, you know, it's not a hundred percent certain, but the, the um, sputum eventually did grow or at least had some mucor species. So, I mean, of course they throw in the, the, the caveat that they can't, you know, distinguish true infection from contamination, but patient died a few hours after that, that stroke CT. So I don't know what else it would be, just given how rapid it was. I don't know. Do you guys have any other thoughts? No, I mean, no, that the hyphae maybe just grew into the vessels and thrombosed them. Yeah. I guess because, it, you know, unfortunately we don't get the entire low, but it almost is developing that bird's nest look. I mean, it certainly looks like it's infarcted. Yeah, it does. Different so thing. I think, you know... Wow likely that that's just a, a really severe mucor infection. Okay, let's do this one. So I feel like this one because this is this gets to your hypervascular mediastinal mass differential. This is a lady who has a lot of comorbidities, but a couple of years ago underwent routine blood testing and was found to have a an elevated or she was hypercalcemic elevated parathormone level. And the neck, the neck ultrasound was negative. They went to parathyroid scan. And let's see, we're gonna have to fuse these. And you'll see that there's something in that lights up in the mediastinum just behind the trachea. So we go to the CT and here's your hypervascular mass in the just posterior to the esophagus that correlates with that area of increased uptake on the parathyroid scan. So it looks like it's, you know, parathyroid adenoma being one of the hypervascular lesions in the chest. But what's interesting is the superior, what looks like the superior portion of this also has, you know, a little bit more high density to it. And it just so happens that when we were looking at this in multiplanar reformat, that this is actually the parathyroid adenoma and it's just below a Zenker's diverticulum. So this is actually oral contrast in this thing. And so right. they... Originally, it was thought that this was a um, that this was like a five centimeter mass, but it's actually you know you can see there's a fat plane in between them. There's different density, and that the parathyroid adenoma is actually just this thing. So that changed their you know the plan on surgery because they originally thought it was a much larger thing. They did this through a VATS and resected it, and I'll show this. This is a post-operative CT where of course they left behind the diverticulum, and now you can see this patient has like three pills stuck in their diverticulum, but the uh, parathyroid adenoma is gone. So ectopic middle mediastinal parathyroid hypervascular adenoma posterior esophagus. So I've never seen one in that particular location before. Oh, they're extremely rare. Back I, oh. I've never seen one back there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, and then the, the diverticulum just makes it even more interesting. So. Yeah. Gosh. Wow. I will I will show one more, and this is a, this will get back to that other pericardium case I showed. So I, I had lost this case to follow up. I kind of even forgot about it until I recently saw a follow-up CT on this patient. As you can see on these radiographs, these were, oh, no, I, well, she had a radiograph of two months before this one that was relatively normal heart size as it looks on the more recent one. So you can see a big globular configuration to her heart. She was coming in with dyspnea, so certainly worrisome for a pericardial effusion. So I saw this CT, and I do have, I think, one of the prior CTs, yeah. So this CT was a month before, and so between you know, September and October, she developed this huge pericardial effusion. It's impressive that it was over the course of a month that it got this big, but it was there were some clinical signs of tamponade, certainly looked like that. 
And with this one, you can see that there's a lot of intermediate attenuation. So this was like, I think 40 Hounsfield units, somewhere 36, as you can see there. So, you know, not necessarily as high as you would expect for acute blood, but it certainly made me nervous. And then she, in, in fact, had, had a prior infarct and looked like a little fatty metaplasia there. And so thinking about causes of you know, acute blood or subacute blood, her aorta looks okay. We weren't sure if she'd had a ruptured MI or something. It didn't really look like that, but I was a little nervous just given the presence of her coronary disease and the fact that her heart looked a little, you know, a little low attenuation in areas. But um, then we finally got more stories. She had a history of lupus and she also has a small pleural effusion on the right, a uh, little bit of fibrosis actually, but she had recently, they thought had a lupus flare and at the same time, her INR had bumped because she has lupus anticoagulant. Her INR was over 10 when she came in. So they did a subxiphoid window. This was all bloody products like subacute that they drained. So they attributed it to just the combination of the lupus flare and then the blood from the fact that her INR was so high. Uh, but, you know, probably a serositis that I don't know if that incited the bleeding, you know, given that her INR was elevated or not, but just to Nice case with the radiographic correlate too. Cool, hmm. very impressive. And then, yeah, and then most, and then here she was at the end of. This is when I saw her last week or whatever. And you know, did her, I'm trying to see. Is it, yeah. did, the pericardi, did the pericardium scar down much? Doesn't really. It doesn't little, look that bad. Yeah, a little thick, not too. I bad. mean, a little thick or trace amount of fluid there anteriorly, but yeah, there's not a lot left. I, I've not seen a lupus pericarditis or lupus um, pericarditis look like that. I mean, that much. So I, I how yeah, much I of, it, was it, was it, was it frankly bloody or was it just kind of? It was, it was, they just said it was bloody. And I think it's probably, there was a lot, I have the description here. I mean, they just said it was bloody effusion. Okay. But yeah, and I, th I think it was probably, I mean, yeah, I haven't seen frankly bloody one just from lupus. I think it's just the fact that her INR was 10. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'll stop there for now, Jeff, and All right. I go back around to. Cool. Thanks. I can go, Jeff. All righty. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. Share. So, um, this is a congenital heart disease, uh, and you can see that there's no. No real tricuspid valve plane. Uh, you can also nicely see the uh, pretty large ASD, which is really post-surgical um, and uh, with flow from the right atrium into the left atrium. And this is a case of tricuspid atresia with an intact ventricular septum. So, um, you know, you have the valve. And in most of the cases, it's, it's not really tricuspid atresia. I think that's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it, it's a hypoplastic tricuspid valve. In many of these cases, there, like again, there's this little valve, and it does it does open to some degree, uh, and it vary, varying degrees depending on the patient. Um, but it's just this kind of hypoplastic, deformed tricuspid valve in a very small, uh, in this case, not that small right ventricle. And this is an interesting case because whenever you have that combination of tricuspid atresia with intact ventricular septum. Um, you always have to look for uh, coronary sinusoids, which are uh, basically um, fistula between the actual chamber itself. Let me just reset this orientation and the ventricle. So you can see that here we have this massively dilated right, vent uh, right coronary artery and then all these tortuous vessels that then dump into the uh, right ventricle and actually communicate with them. And I think many years ago, I've showed a case in a baby. This is a 22 year old patient um, in a baby who had actually had no coronary arteries and her entire circulation was fed by coronary sinusoids um, that basically fed into this tangle of vessels that fed her coronaries. Uh, but it's just a nice example of these, these sinusoids that form. And whenever, again, if you just hear of tricuspid atresia or tricuspid hypoplasia and intact ventricular septum, the majority of these people, 60, 70%, will have these sinusoids. And it's, uh, no one's really sure 100%, you know, why these, uh, you know, coronary cameral fistulas develop. And 
my theory is it's a way to basically drain the blood out of this because you're still getting flow across this tricuspid valve and you're getting extreme high pressures in this um, right atrium, uh, right ventricle that uh, subsequently somehow fistulize with the coronary arteries to allow for uh, decompression of that ventricle. But in some cases, again, that is the only uh, supply of blood to the coronaries. So just, just a nice case we had last week. Um, this is a case, let me go to this case. Let me make sure I have the right order. This is a tough case. Um, this is a patient who the only history was, uh, <laughs> this was a PE study. Um, not as pretty as Travis's PE study showed the other day in the Fontan, but I wish I could pull up the history and show it. There was no mention of congenital heart disease. All it said was shortness of breath. Um, on the indication, and we did a routine PE study, and you can see that uh, this patient has a <laughs> uh, various reasons for shortness of breath. The patient has a hypoplastic uh, left heart and has a Fontan and has basically a monoatrium uh, and a lot of other things. And you can see there's this little hypoplastic aortic root in this um, aortic root is is there and often serves the coronary arteries and it attaches uh, to the, because this was in some way the form, because you have this hypoplastic LV and uh, there's this little tiny, let me get into a plane, aortic root and aortic valve. And it, it always pretty much anastomoses with the um, large, this is technically was at some point the pulmonary artery and kind of becomes the systemic uh, supply here, but nonetheless, we still have this little thing dangling off here, which is the old or native hypoplastic aortic root. And, uh, you know, the person who read it was busy looking for PE or whatever. And if you look, it's extremely subtle. Um, you know, I'm going to point it out in retrospect, you'll say it's there, but it's, it's pretty subtle. You can see that there's this lack of filling here in this hypoplastic aortic root. You can still see the coronaries coming off it here. So the patient had chest pain. Um, this was red and unfortunately wasn't really detected, which again, I, I have no fault on the radiologist for that. It was a rule out PE study. And then unfortunately the patient developed uh, severe chest pain and a very pronounced troponin bump. And you can see this is a RCA injection or they're attempting to inject the RCA and um, huh. this thing basically, yeah, yeah. this thing basically embolized and uh, occluded the right coronary artery, and yeah, and the right coronary artery was her um, dominant vessel. She was big time RCA dominant, yeah, so yeah. she developed a um, you know major infarct because of this thrombus yeah, in the hypoplastic native aortic root, which is uh, again. A known but rare complication yeah, of right. patients with hypoplastic left heart. So, so that's so, a so just to clarify, is that a that's a DKS that they did then? I'm sorry. Or is that a DKS or Damus K Stanzel? Is that how you know? Is it it's anastomosed to the pulmonary artery to to fill the coronaries? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I, yeah. I've, yeah. I've never seen thrombus in one. That's crazy. Yeah. Just that, yeah. yeah. So I don't know who's who's got noise in the back, but uh, yeah, and she. She thrombosed it and basically now has, um, you know, her EF went to almost nothing. Um, she didn't have a great EF to start, but basically now has just this absolutely massive infarct and now is on the transplant list. And, you know, the clinicians are very upset, but, um, you know, I tried to explain to them that it's really a very hard thing to make that diagnosis prospectively. And you can see on the follow-up aorta study, you can see that that thrombus is, is gone. So it's just an unfortunate case, but kind of rare, but unfortunate. Um, and then lastly, just to speed things up, I'll show this just very bad. Uh, you know, we've all seen bad lymphoma cases. Um, this is just another bad lymphoma case. And, and what's impressive about this is not just the cardiac involvement. You can see this big cardiac mass and the, par so, and the pericardial fusion, which is ligand in the tumor. But it's really impressive. So this is a study about uh, mid-January, and then this is the follow-up study uh, a few days or a few weeks later. 
and you can see how much yeah, this yeah. cardiac mass is so much bigger. And then additionally, look at what's happened to the kidneys. Before the, there was some little hypodensities in the yeah, kidneys, yeah, yeah. but now there's this in you know massive um, infiltration of lymphoma into the kidneys yeah, just in a very yeah, short period yeah. of time. So just a really bad case of uh, of <laughs> lymphoma with you know yeah, yeah. short term pronounced involvement of the uh, myocardium and uh, kidneys. Yeah, just yeah. All right. So, anyways. Jeff, I'll, I'll stop there. All right. Thanks, Seth. Those are cool. All right. Who's up? Howard. I just got mine. Okay. All right. All right. It's weird. Everyone, I think everyone hears that background noise, but it's like a re repeating loop of noise. Does anyone else hear that? Yeah. Yeah. But it's it's saying the same thing over and over again. It's like a somehow saying it over again. It's strange. Um, this is a person that I became aware of a little while ago. And the reason he had this CT, which is from October of 2012, and uh, open lung biopsy very soon thereafter is, is obscure. I don't know if he had symptoms produced by this pattern or not, but it's a really wonderful pattern of diffuse centrilobular round glass attenuating nodules that become more confluent and more numerous in the lower lung zones where the opacities eventually become more ill-defined round glass attenuating but a really nice demonstration of centrolobular ground glass nodules. And I think we all think of the usual of two common things. One is if the person's a smoker, one would think of smokers' macrophages. And of course, this would be pretty severe down there, but particularly hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which this one is not. So what else would one think of? Perhaps if someone is on on medications, one might think of this as a manifestation of drug toxicity, being some form of lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis. But this turned out to be, here's a really nice description of the pathology. So this is follicular bronchiolitis. Let me just go to the summary here, which shows and describes the classic findings of lymphoid follicles that form with germinal centers in relation to bronchioles. So a very nice example of that, maybe the nicest one that I've seen. And then typically this shows that the things I generally think of, or the three big categories are follicular bronchiolitis in association with the connective tissue disorder, particularly rheumatoid. The second group would be patients with various kinds of immunodeficiency disorders like CVID and ask whether the patient, sorry, has AIDS. And then the other one is just sporadic. So as best we can tell, this is just sporadic. As best we know, he might have received steroid therapy for a little while after 2012, but as best we know, he didn't receive any kind of sustained treatment. He developed coronary artery disease and other things. And Certainly, it's still abnormal, but not nearly as bad as before. And we doesn't seem to have any progressive lung disease from it. So it's kind of sporadic, idiopathic, and not particularly progressive over a period of years. So I don't quite know what to make of that, but it's, it's a very nice path, rad path correlation for follicular bronchiolitis. And he's undergone an extensive connective tissue disease workup, and it's all negative? I think he doesn't have any clinical findings to suggest a connective tissue disorder. I don't know, in terms of serology, what he, what has been done. But I don't think he's developed any signs or symptoms suggestive of any particular connective tissue disorder that I know of. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen just a, a sporadic or idiopathic case. Have you... No, yes, I never. Yeah. I don't see it very often anyway, but I've always seen it no. in the context of collagen vascular disease. 
So I think there seems to be a group, at least according to this article, that is sporadic, middle-aged and elderly. And perhaps that one is one that doesn't progress necessarily, as one sees down there. It's curious, isn't it? Very interesting, yeah. Yeah. All right, this one is, here I can just show you the history right off the bat. So that's exactly the history that, that we have. He was attending a baseball game, experienced an episode or episodes of coughing, pop in his left chest and pain. And he's a big pillar, so we don't have a chest radiograph, but I would suspect that it wouldn't show anything because of the location of what you'll see now, which is rather impressive if he just had one episode of a big cough. So here is that big defect. There is a fracture right there, but a rather impressive tear of his intercostal muscles spreading a part of the ribs and transcostal herniation of lung. It's quite impressive wow. for, for just maybe one episode of bad coughing. So, you know, that's really interesting because that. you've got to tear through three muscles, the endothoracic fascia, and you wonder if he had something, a previous, in, was there anything to suggest a previous injury there? Let's have a look and see if there's anything weird about it. I don't know. And this, this fracture looks quite right. acute. Yeah. Just one right there. So I don't know, but it's very impressive. So they fixed that. Put the lung back in. And there you are. Don't know what to make of that. Wow, that's, a, that's <laughs> quite a case. Yeah. This one we actually came across um, just a little while ago. So my resident and I, my resident's with me. Um, we're looking at this rib series and he does not have a fracture. So now I need to blow it up. Let me see if I can bring up one that shows these soft tissue calcifications better. So here we go. And I'll bring it there. So check these calcifications out that we can see there. I'll make it even bigger. And you can see the morphology of the soft tissue calcifications. A good many of them are not quite round, but they're so-called rice grain calcifications. Mm -hmm. Some are getting a little bit bigger to be the so-called, what do they call those, cigar or sausage calcifications or cigar calcifications if they're quite large in this person. And this CT of the abdomen shows wow. the fun beautifully. So these are the classic rice grain calcifications that are oriented parallel to muscle bundles, muscle bundles of cysticercosis as an incidental finding. <laughs> Did you get any history that might have also supported that? Was there any, like? Um, I haven't had time to look at the history going back in time. But I know these were discovered way back in 04 on some neck imaging. And he does not have brain lesions of cysticercosis, but this was noticed previously back in 04 at least. So I haven't really had time to, I just did this a little while ago cool. to figure out how the cysts basically leave the bowel and then the cysts may go to all kinds of places, including obviously muscles, where they may calcify like that. And that's a bit of the life cycle of sodium, tunia sodium, so kind of cute. Incidental finding, I think that's the first one I've, that I remember seeing. Yeah, I've never seen a case. Let's see where else we could look. Well, the RIP series shows those rather nicely, right? Okay, I've got a few more, but I, I would like to save those for next time. So, okay. Jeff? Yeah, I can show a few more here. Let's see. All righty. Hold on here. Um, okay. 
There we go. All right. So uh, this is a nice uh, case that we were looking at um, in our section last week. This is uh, an older patient uh, with some lung. Uh, this was cancer follow-up. You can see, um, but there's also these uh, pleural plaques, nice calcified pleural plaques. There's one in the hemidiaphragm there. So asbestos exposure. Um, but this is probably one of the best examples, and Chris Meyer pointed this one out to us. Um, just a really uh, one of the early findings, or one of the findings that's been um, described in uh, asbestosis, is the presence of these subpleural curvilinear lines, and you'll see them, for example, here in the middle lobe, away from the plaque. And uh, I'll show an old. There was an old paper, not that old, but from early 2000s, that compared patients with IPF and those with asbestosis. Now I do take some of those older studies with a little bit of grain of salt because the clinical definition of IPF was a little less stringent back then, and I'm not sure what they used. But you can see there's non-dependent ground glass, maybe some very fine reticulation. Uh, another early finding is sort of a subpleural dot that's been described. The thought was it was a peribronchiolar fibrosis. Um, I don't see great examples of that, but these subpleural lines right there are really, really, really nice examples of that and are thought to be more suggestive of an asbestosis than an IPF. Now, in this patient with plaque, we would presume that the fibrosis is asbestosis and not just bland UIP. Uh, here's that article. I'll pull it up here. You can. This is from, um, what was it, AJR back in uh, 2002 published 2013, but there's a chart in here and I'll show you. They, they had a fair number of patients right here. So they had uh, 80 patients with asbestosis, 80 with IPF, and the subplural, you can see the subplural dot, 81% in the asbestosis group and only 25% in the IPF group. Uh, but, and then this, um, where would it go? There's a, a subplural line right there, about 70% or so in the asbestosis group and only 28%. So it, whether it has something to do with the plaques out in the periphery or the pleural involvement, if it's the asbestos fibers itself, it's unclear. But, um, you know, in equivocal cases, it's some, an important finding to look for. So um, you can comb through this case and look at some of the lines. But I thought it was a really nice example of that to share. Um, quick, quick question related to asbestos. This came up uh, recently. It was a discussion. Have you ever seen unilateral plaques, pleural plaques from asbestos, because yes. I, I always think of unilateral pleural disease as being like old hemothorax or empyema, and you look close enough and you'll see stuff on both sides in, in asbestos. Yeah, I actually saw a case this week. Um, they're clearly plaque and not like fibrothorax. And on the other side, there's there was absolutely nothing? I, I combed that CT the best I could, and these are all thin cuts. I mean, I could not find a plaque to save my life. Um, I've seen asymmetric ones or where it's real subtle, but I mean, sure. it does occur for what okay. reason, I don't understand. Yeah, it seems, but to in be, general, it's usually bilateral. Oh, far more often. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, even in the, um, some of the, uh, epidemiologic stuff we've looked at, we've seen unilateral plaque. I don't know the exact number, but I think it's pretty low. I'd say, you know, easily below 10%, probably closer to five, if even that much. Okay, um, I have another blasto case. I don't have the third one loaned up, um, but this is an, another case of blasto affecting lung and a different organ. So I don't have a radiograph, but on the CT, um, you can see there's this cavity kind of crossing the fissure. Um, so, you know, it's got a smooth wall, no fluid. So it almost looks like a TB cavity. There's some smaller cavities next to it there. Um, and then, um, the patient was actually had originally presented with, um, this was picked up on a neck CT right there, but the patient actually presented with some hoarseness. Uh, this was the neck CT done. And if you look at the neck CT, um, you know, prospectively, and this was read by a head and neck person is, is really nothing in the, in the head and neck. I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, so that was on at time presentation. This was a picture from the endoscopy the second day or nothing, the, the uh, laryngoscopy the second day. And, Clearly, you can see there's thickening here, this plaque nodularity, and this was uh, biopsied, and uh, this is blastomycosis. Hmm. You know, and going back, and I am definitely not a head and neck. I liked head and neck imaging as a resident, but I'm it's hard. I, I think the, the vocal cords are really hard, but there's some asymmetry to them, but I don't think that anything's callable. So it's possible it evolved over the course of 24 hours, but you know, maybe in retrospect, there's a little asymmetry there, but... This is another blastomycosis, um, and, and almost I've 
almost always involves lung. Um, there's some mosaic attenuation in the lungs. I think some of that may be some underlying chronic. I can't remember if it's smoke or not, but another blastomycosis. And um, this is something we've seen a lot of, but this was a really nice case. So this is a, a 76-year-old ma male who has um, is on daptomycin for a skin infection. And uh, this was the initial radiograph presented with cough and some shortness of breath and has these really nice areas of peripheral consolidation. You can actually see the an atoll sign or reversed halo on a radiograph here. It's denser on the outside. Um, and then underwent chest CT. Um, I'm not sure why, but this one's a little different in that it shows crazy paving, which can be seen with organizing pneumonia. Um, but and if we go, let me, I'll go to the axials. Um, but you can see there's these discrete areas of consolidation ground glass. And one of the findings I rely on a lot too in, in organizing pneumonia to help distinguish it from hemorrhage and edema is you'll see these, or at least help, I guess, um, is these spared lobules and this sharp demarcation. Hemorrhage is usually sort of fades out along the edges. Same with edema. It'd be unusual to have just discrete spared lobules, admix. You see it all throughout. And I, I think that can be a helpful sign. And if you're trying to make the distinction, um, I don't know how sensitive or specific it is, but it can be, I find it helpful. And then there's the area there on the CT, you can see on the axial images, you can see the classic appearance of organizing lung injury. The adaptomycin was stopped, and here's a follow up radiograph just a month later, and you can see it got a lot better. So it tends to go away pretty quickly. All right, yeah. uh, Travis, did you want to show a few more? Uh, let me let me show um, a couple more here. All right. This is a this is a quickie just because this is one you know you can make the diagnosis across the room. Twenty nine year old man who came in. He was referred here for evaluation of pulmonary hypertension, but you can see he has abnormal marrow expansion and all of. Not only is it the bone, but he's got soft tissue kind of paralleling those. And then you got this lumpy, bumpy stuff along the posterior medium, mediastinum on both sides. And so you can see on, on his CT, no surprise. And this is very similar to one I showed when I was at Emory four or five years ago. That, but all of this is just soft tissue expansion from extramedullary hematopoiesis and, and beta thalassemia. Interestingly, you can see his pulmonary artery is enlarged. And... So he was transferred here for workup of pulmonary hypertension. His RV may be borderline thick, and his RV function, you can see it's hypertrophy there. His RV function was normal. And so I was looking through their pulmonary hypertension notes, and they're actually attributing this mostly to group five pulmonary hypertension from splenectomy rather than just recurrent transfusion or, or other things intrinsically related to his, uh, his beta thalassemia. So that, I thought that was kind of interesting. Because group five, we think of systemic diseases like sarcoids under there, Langerhans cell histiocytosis. You know, it's kind of a wastebasket. But I'd never seen one that, where they were actually, at least, trying to attribute it to splenectomy, even though that's on the list. Now, this one I, I would appreciate everyone's input. This is a middle-aged man, asymptomatic, had this as part of some sort of employment screening, some whatnot. We don't have a lateral, but you can see there's. Abnormal opacity here in the right paratracheal region. Doesn't look like an aortic arch. He has a nice, normal left-sided aortic arch. I showed a case a couple of years ago of what I think this is. I think this is the third of these that I will have seen. Uh, they did a subsequent PET. There was really no metabolic activity in this thing. But at the outside hospital, this has been called like probably a liposarcoma. I disagree with that. I think you see that there's mostly lower attenuation. You have essentially a fat fluid level in this thing. So I think this is probably going to be a mature cystic teratoma. The surgeon's a little surprised just because he's middle-aged, but I've seen two other ones in the right paratracheal space, and I'm curious what the rest of you think about that, if there's anything else you'd include. Because no, I think... I like your best guess. Because I remember, I and I even had a... Brent Little had a video of one of them from the surgeon. They cut into this thing, and it was like paste or peanut butter that came out of it with all the sebum. So I'm... I'm thinking that's probably what this is. It's just a cystic teratoma. So, but if anybody else has any other ideas, I'm open to suggestion. Otherwise, that's what I'm going completely out on a limb with that. So, okay, well. Good thought, yeah. It's well circumscribed, not large. 
Yeah, let's see. Um, this is just a quick radiographic finding. You know, we always like to, you know, the PA view. She's, this is a, an older patient. She's got a tortuous aorta. And then this is why, you know, one of the things I always remind my residents and fellows to look at on the lateral view. And the first thing really I look at is the spine. This patient came in with back pain and you can see that there's what looks like just a focal compression fracture here. But if you look at even more closely, you can see that you know, not only is this vertebral body gone or completely crunched, but this one looks a little irregular too. So she had had a recent fracture. She had a traumatic fall. And after that became bacteremic and had worsening back pain. And so this actually ended up being uh, discitis osteomyelitis. And you can see this was before that radiograph, but the, there's already disc centered destruction on both sides of the end plate here and enhancement of both levels, a little bit of enhancement anteriorly and posteriorly. So I don't think I've ever seen infection as a complication of, a, at least it was a presumed traumatic fracture. Uh, but this, they went and debrided this. You can see the correlate on the CT. This actually grew E. coli, which is kind of surprising, but it's subtle E. coli discitis osteomyelitis best seen on the lateral view. So I always think of these patients as like end-stage renal disease, patients with bacteremia, but not specifically from trauma as in this case. Let's see, and I don't, yeah, let me see if I have any, if any of these other ones are interested, interesting to show. Oh yeah, this one, we've shown this before, and I, I know I've shown a case, I think David and Howard, I think have shown cases, and maybe others. This is a guy who was undergoing a, a TAVR workup, and this was a CT back in 2017, and you can see in his upper lobes, he's just got some kind of nondescript ground glass opacities, maybe a little bit of smooth septal thickening, no effusions. And you see his marrow and his, his bones just look diffusely abnormal. It's kind of a permeative appearance. This is known myelofibrosis. And you can see he has aortic valve calcification at the time. And so the, the stuff in the lungs was just kind of chalked up to maybe edema. You, you will see on the more recent study that it's I would argue it's not edema since it's still going to be there. And this was his TAVR study. And so my best guess is that this is just going to be extramedullary hematopoiesis in the lung parenchyma. We're not going to get a tissue diagnosis, but, you know, it looks kind of similar to some of the cases we've shown before. Very and I was much. curious if you guys agree. Yes, mm -hmm. definitely. For sure. And then the other question is, why the heck do they get lobular sparing? Because I've seen, I think the other case I've seen had the same thing and I can't find any explanation, but I don't know if you guys know anything or not, but. Don't know, I think it's just a random inexplicable thing. Okay, but yeah, so diffuse ground glass in, in the setting of extramedullary or of, of myelofibrosis especially, it's always something to think about. And then I think even on this radiograph back in 2016, there's some vague upper lobe opacities that are probably, you know, the same process, but you can see his bones are already abnormal at that point in time. Yeah, so, very interesting. Yeah, presumed extramedullary hematopoiesis of the lung, you know, on our differential for chronic ground glass opacities in the appropriate setting. So I will stop there. I think we'll- uh, Yeah, we can wrap it up today. Rest for next Certainly. week. All right, well, those are great cases. And very nice. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, have a great rest of your week, and I'll talk right. to you next week. You too. Thanks, everyone. Weekend. All right. Yep.